here with our with our wonderful neighbor Laura and um it's a three-part class as I think you all know so we're getting started this week with Gruner Veltliner and um I'm just gonna encourage everyone so we get the right vibe going for our class to um tune into your heart and think of something that you can feel grateful for in this moment and um yeah you can pop it into the chat box if you want. Um, oh, I'll just, a few uh, housekeeping items. Uh, Laura is gonna be leading us. And if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into the, the group chat and I'll I'll keep a, an eye on it and can uh, relay those questions to Laura. Or if it seems like a good moment, feel free to um, turn off your mute button and just ask the question out loud. But otherwise try and keep muted because we get, it gets chaotic otherwise. So keep your mute on and welcome and grateful to have you all here. And I'll turn it over to Laura Steck, our neighbor, friend, chef, all kinds of things. Laura Steck, thank you. Hey, Neely Winery. How y'all doing? Laura Steck here, Portola Valley, California, broadcasting <laughs> from my kitchen. Uh, where we like to stir things up. Uh, when I teach in corporate, I call this kitchen TV. And uh, it's great to be here with you today. Uh, we want you to encourage to uh, turn your oven on to 350 if you have not and open your chat box if you think you might wanna use the chat box, which is the opportunity that Neely just mentioned and that Lucy just mentioned. <laughs> I can't believe, I have a friend that's, whose name is Neely you I have a friend whose name, yeah, I've told you this before, that, and I have a friend whose name is Lucy Neely. It's, her name is Cornelia, but people call her Neely. So often I, I call one the other, but anyways, I haven't done that in a while. Uh, anyways, the chat box is there for you to ask questions. Um, uh, I, if you ask a question, I may not be able to answer because we are doing multiple things during this class. So um, that's a good way to keep the question alive if we can't answer it right away for you. Um, I'm excited to be here. We're going to be doing uh, three to four dishes today. Um, with this class and any of the classes, you can do a dish. If you're new, new, new to cooking online and it seems a little daunting, you can do the whole menu if you choose. You can also use the video at the end and we'll post it either on my YouTube channel or the Neely YouTube channel. I don't even, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, so you can use the video later should you want to do it. Um, my style for people that have never taken a class from me, I'm very plant forward. Um, I wrote a book, Cold Cuisine, Taking the Bite Out of Global Warming. And I've been very active in food and environment. And so I'm definitely plant forward. But that, that, that means that meat is not my enemy, but it is not my muse. So today's class is, it's, it's um, we, no meat. And then next week's class will be vegan for the masses. And then the weekend, the class after that will be a lamb Moroccan stew and a tempeh Moroccan stew. We're gonna make bread and preserve lemons and all kinds of stuff. So that's our advanced class. And um, if you have any questions again, please ask. Good questions are, I have allergies to this or I don't like this. Can you give me a substitute? And uh, that's our, um, that's the beginning of class. All right, so there are many philosophies about food and wine pairing. Um, when I was younger, I was very intimidated by the whole thing. I thought that somebody had some amazing talent about food and wine pairing, and they were going to take us to this, you know, to this futuristic uh, way of being able to uh, could, um, deal with the two. And as I've gotten older, I've realized that it's very personal. In fact, our tongues are have as much variety as our thumbprints. We, we have a tongue print that's individual to us. And with that gives us the right to like or dislike anything that we want. So I think that some of the very specifics about food and wine, well, they, they about the how this affects this kind of um, passes me by actually, but there are some things that I think really do hold. And, um, to when we were preparing for this class, the team from Neely and myself, we basically sat down with the wine, started to drink it, brought in a few foods that we thought might work with it, 
and kind of just did an organic pairing and build the menu from there. So if you're one of those people that may, if you're a super taster and you can tell me exactly what everything tastes like and fits with, great. But if you're more like me, um, you know, we can relax a little knowing that what we like is what we like. And we try to find some more general ideas to bring out the, um, the, um, the connections between food and wine. Uh, I also hope that your Grunewald Liener, at least this is my choice. And again, it's all very personable and subjective, isn't freezing cold. Uh, I actually took my Gruner out of the refrigerator at 3.30. It, it is, has a little chill, but not much. And I think that's actually, I mean, for me, everyone says white wine should be chilled, but I don't know if, I mean, I really like the flavors, especially of the Neely wine, certainly of the B Block Chardonnay that we're using next week. I don't think I'll even chill the B Block. So again, wine is wine and you get to do it the way you want to. And I think that uh, uh, the Neely uh, winery believes in that as well. We are, we're relaxed. We're here to have a good time. Uh, so we are going to do three uh, recipes today. Uh, before I introduce that, I just want to give a plug for the food party, which is the column I write for in the Almanac, Mellow Park Almanac, Mountain View Voice, and Palo Alto Weekly. We're going to start a book group and uh, closer to the middle of the month, you can find my column called The Food Party. And we're going to start a, uh, the Food Party book group again, and we're going to be reading Food Fight, which is the book describing about the, uh, what the farm bill is. So if you've been uh, wondered what the United States Farm Bill is, which is a bill that comes up every four years and basically sets the food uh, agenda for the United States, and you've always wondered kind of how it all works and, and uh, you know what's going to happen when they renew it in September, uh, join us at the Food Party, Menlo Park, Almanac, Mountain View Boys, Palo Weekly for a book group that we'll be doing just through the column, reading the book together and discussing and learning more about the Farm Bill. All right, so the menu today, we're going to be doing two salads, uh, a, um, a fennel and olive and avocado salad that goes great with the Gruner. And then we have an endive salad or appetizer. So I'm going to make the appetizer and probably we'll have time to move on to the salad. We'll see, even though we're starting a little late, 15 minutes. So maybe we will go a little longer. Classes in general will be about probably an hour and 15 I think the last class will probably go to an hour and uh, 30 and so that we all have time to cook and not be too rushed. Uh, so we're going to do two salads. We'll do the and the appetizer, the end up appetizer, and then we're going to do some roasted Brussels sprouts in pear. And we're also going to make uh, for both our salad, our Brussels sprouts and our appetizer, some maple spiced walnuts. And that's what we're going to start with is the walnuts. But before we, so get your walnuts out and your spices out. But before we do that, I think Lucy's going to give us um, some introduction about Gruner Vetliner and a little bit about it. That menu sounds so good. Um, thanks, Laura. Yeah, Gruner Vetliner is an Austrian varietal that I'll just speak to um, its place here at Neely, which is very exciting because uh, most of the vines were planted here at Spring Ridge Vineyard in Neely in the early 80s, and it's all Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. And this is a one acre block of Gruner Veltliner that was planted in 2019. And it is the first planting um, that we've had here that's not Pinot Noir or Chardonnay. Um, so this 2021 vintage of the Gruner Veltliner is our first vintage of this block um, in the in viticulture, you call it the third leaf, which is the, the third growing season. So um, yeah, we love it. We made about 60 cases of it the first year, which was a one ton harvest, and we are enjoying drinking it. It's just uh, right adjacent to the the tasting room, and it's just one, one acre, like I said, so it's a really small production lot, and it'll um, generally be available just in the tasting room and to wine club members and for special events like Sunday dinners with Laura Steck. So um, yeah, it's a really exciting wine to our program. And I'm going to turn it over to Tina Jones, who is Neely's uh, new um, sales and hospitality director, which includes managing the tasting room and the wine club. And she's going to talk a little bit more just about the wine itself. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Oops, yes. let me. 
if you Sorry. notice on your bottle, there's a, I've got it in, there we go. See the Sossel Creek and it's Block Verde. So all of these are hints. Verde is green. Um, Gruner means green in Austrian. Um, when you taste it, you're going to get a lot of the, uh, the greenness just jumps right out. So um, often you think about vegetables and bitter greens like kale and Brussels sprouts is very asparagus challenging to pair with wine. Um, and this is the, the sommelier's uh, secret behind the curtain when you have hard to pair with vegetables. Um, I think that's, I agree with Laura completely that everybody serves white wines far too cold. Um, we've been having a conversation about, you know, what temperature is ideal, but um, for me, all of the flavors really start coming out as the, the white, white wines come more to room temperature. So um, I encourage you to taste it as it comes to room temperature and, and as you're cooking, of course. <laughs> I think that's it, back to you, Laura. Absolutely. It's like we're, we're, we're kind of like the Andy Cohen, uh, Anderson Cooper set here. We, and we, we take you through an entertaining evening and we, uh, drink along the way and we have no, we don't, we take, we apologize for anything that happens at the end of the class. Right. Uh, <laughs> anyways. All right, let's begin. We're going to start with our maple spice walnuts. Um, if you, again, please turn on your, uh, your, um, oven to 350. These walnuts I've made for years at holidays. We might have done a salad or something with these walnuts before. I kind of took out some of the spices that I've used uh, to make it a little bit um, less zingy and, um, and a little bit better for the gruner. But out of all the spice nuts I've ever made in my illustrious 30 plus year career working as a caterer and a chef, I found that these are some of the easiest and um, you know, it's nice to have a candy nut, but often we're lazy to do it. So if you're looking for something that happens fast, uh, this is a good one. So we're gonna start with three cups of walnuts or whatever you might have in front of you. Uh, I want to remind people that I have three cameras. I have the one Laura Steck camera that shows me in the front. Oh. I've got the cutting board camera here. And then I also have in the back, we have the oven, the stove camera. So um, you might not see me talking, you might see there's a stove camera, you might see uh, one of the other cameras and actually probably better for you to be looking at uh, the food instead of lovely Laura. So uh, we realize we've got all three. Um, I've got two cups of walnuts here. So I'm gonna use a little bit less than a half a cup of maple syrup. I'm going to use about a third of a cup of maple syrup. And I'm just going to measure that into a small bowl so that I can mix my spices into it. So I've got some organic syrup here from uh, Bianchini's. Um, this as well as everything else has been, has gotten extremely expensive as I'm sure everyone realizes. Uh, but real maple syrup, you can't compare. I mean, you can buy sugar syrup that has the hint of maple, whatever in it that they add and save yourself a couple bucks. But in the end, there's nothing that compares to maple syrup. So it's an investment that is, um, is worth the while. And if you're following the recipe exactly, it's three cups of, of walnuts to uh, half a cup of maple syrup. And then we're gonna move in some cloves. Uh, I've just got some powdered cloves here, a half a teaspoon into the maple syrup. I've got some nutmeg and nutmeg as with almost as any spice is much better fresh than powdered. So whenever you can toast those cumin seeds and grind them before you put them into your sauce, that's beneficial, certainly with nutmeg as well. Um, I'm sure many people have seen the uh, microplanes that can be used to grate not only nutmeg, but cheeses and chocolates. Definitely a nice gift for people, even though we've just finished the gift season. And I'm just gonna take my fresh nutmeg and grind in myself about a half teaspoon of nutmeg. So you can add that. Unfortunately, these microplanes do get dull and I don't know of any way to sharpen them. So you have to you know, get a new one every once in a while, which gives you another opportunity for a gift. So if your microplane doesn't work that well, it's time to get a new one. I've got some ground ginger, about a half teaspoon again. Uh, these do not have to be exact. In fact, I like it a little bit more spicy. So you can decide how you uh, enjoy that. I've got some uh, cayenne pepper, 
about a half teaspoon. Now, of course, if you don't like spice, you know, you can leave it out, you can use less. But there is a nice mixture between the, you know, the zing of the ginger, the depth of the clove, the piquant of the cayenne pepper, and then we're going to add a teaspoon of salt into this. And they work well together. So, um, you know, adjust accordingly to your own tastes. Laura, this is sounding delicious. Yeah, really simple, easy. You don't need to add anything else to it. Um, my nuts, of course, have not been toasted yet. They are raw. And I'm just going to mix those spices in with a whisk into my maple syrup. And then we're going to pour that into our nuts. Now you could put it all in the same bowl. You don't necessarily have to mix the spices in with the maple syrup. It's another bowl, but you know, there is, there is um, support that mixing your spices into your base is a better way to incorporate, but you know, if you didn't do and you added it straight to the bowl, no worries. Now, the thing about walnuts is they have a lot of grooves. You know, walnuts are kind of all over the place, right? So you want to really make sure that you can get that spice into those little folds and things. Um, I'm amazed how many people, I, so I've worked privately as a chef. I do corporate jobs. I do um, uh, I do a lot of consulting for different, I'm a chef for hire. I do all kinds of things. I have a very different kind of um, career. But I've worked in a lot of people's homes over my life, and I'm surprised at how many people don't have like one of these uh, sill pad or whatever, just larger uh, quality, can stand up to heat spatulas in their kitchens. So, you know, if you have, you've been using the same cooking equipment for 20 years, and even if you maybe have gotten some new stuff since then, there's so many advancements that have happened in culinary, and it's one of those things that they actually keep spending time and money on to come up with new things. So definitely look at some of your equipment. A lot of the time, it might be time to get some new stuff. A lot of the times people don't like cooking because their equipment in their kitchen's crappy. They don't have a good cutting board. Their knife is dull, right? They don't even have a good spatula. So these types of things make cooking more enjoyable. And that's why we wanna invest every once in a while in some new stuff. And um, so when you've got those nuts all set, I want you to put them on a baking sheet. And you, I, I have a sill pat, which is a permanent piece of parchment that I've used for many years. You can use parchment, you can use a sill pat. If you put it directly onto a baking sheet, it, would get, it might stick to the bottom and be hard to release. So that's why a piece of uh, uh, parchment or a piece of, or a sill pat mat is a wonderful um, addition to your kitchen and helpful for something like making candied nuts. You wanna smash those down into a single layer. And then we're gonna pop that into our oven. 350. Now everybody's oven is different. Everybody's equipment is always different. I may encourage you, especially if you have an older oven, and even if you have a Thermador, which I've cooked on a lot of Thermador ovens, and I'll tell you, they got problems. Uh, put a, you know, get an oven thermometer and put it in your, put it in your oven, especially if it's older and if it's a Thermador. Um, it's good to have a backup to have some uh, oven, uh, have a thermometer that's telling you whether or not the actual temperature of your oven is the temperature that you want. And we're gonna set our timer uh, for six minutes. And I'll set the timer, you don't have to do that. You're all busy, I know. And then at six minutes, we're gonna go back in and check our nuts and make sure that they're coming along the way we want them to. Maple spice walnuts. All right. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Sounding mm -hmm. good. I think it's time for a glass Toast. of Gruner and later. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. In but fact, this Gruner, I've either, I, I want this, this is a question for me to Tina or Lucy. Maybe I've gotten used to Gruner because I remember the first time I had Gruner at your place. I was like, wow, that is the most unique thing I've ever tasted. Now, I still think it's unique, but it, it's not as surprising as in, Maybe I've gotten used to it. Like the flavor is really unique, but maybe I've gotten you. You know, do you do you 
do you naturally get more in tune to Gruner or is it something that people still kind of go, wow, I've never had a glass of wine like this at all. Anybody, any thoughts? Tina, any thoughts there? Do you get used to it? Oh, Have Tina, I gotten used sorry, to it? There. I unmuted. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. We can hear you. Yeah. So I, I think that the people who've had Gruner before expect it, and I don't want to say you get used to it, but because it's not a new, unexpected kind of, you know, right. green tart, you know, it, it, once you've had it and it's not that initial surprise, um, then I think it's a little bit, but, but if somebody's never had it before that first, like, what is this? This is not a Chardonnay. Um, I think you're not alone in that one. Yeah, it's such a unique flavor. And it is really, I, I completely agree with Tina. It's, it's just one of these wines that can hold up to crazy things such as Brussels sprouts. What <laughs> wine could you ever blend with Brussels sprouts? If I was really talented, like Lucy Neely, I'd juggle them for you, but I'm not that good. <laughs> Um, but Brussels sprouts, uh, I love them. Um, I think Brussels sprouts are similar to broccoli, and this is coming from the vegetarian in me, which says there's something about Brussels sprouts and definitely broccoli that are, is more like meat than, say, a carrot or lettuce. Like if I'm eating something and I want to be, be satisfied, mm -hmm. broccoli always feels kind of more like meat than a tomato does to me. <laughs> and I actually did some research on that. Broccoli has amino acid profile similar to beef. Get that. What? I'm serious. Amazing. I don't know about Brussels. I know it's crazy. Now I'm not saying that it, it doesn't have as much protein. It has an amino acid profile that's similar. And I don't, maybe you will just naturally agree that when you eat, you know, if you're going to have some broccoli as compared to having a salad, um, it, broccoli seems heartier and Brussels sprouts seem to fall in that category for mm -hmm. me, not as much, but I, I don't know if they have an amino uh, acid profile like broccoli, but anyways, they, they are strange uh, for it comes to pairing when it comes to pairing. And here we are, we have our perfect wine. Hey, Laura, I now, think we have our first question from Byron please. and Julie. Yeah, I'm oh, back. To, hi, I'm right here. I'm back to the wine. Is the Gruner sort of most associated with a certain part of the world? Like, I don't know, like Austria or? <laughs> the leading question. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's from Austria. Okay. It means green wine of Veltliner and Veltliner is in Austria. All right. So, yeah. and, and they bottle it as Gruner or whatever it is, not as... Gruner Veltliner, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a varietal itself. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Where'd you get your uh, your uh, cuttings for it? Um, from a from a nursery. There's, you know, there's certified nurseries because the plant stock has to be really clean and like clone certified. I can't remember which nursery it was. But you can you you didn't have to smuggle them in from Austin. Yeah, no, it was in suitcase <laughs> cuttings. We we bought them on the on the open market. Thank you. <laughs> so for the Brussels sprouts, um, I can't see the group anymore. So maybe I'll, I'll walk over and change my camera view. But for now, we'll just keep going. Um, hopefully your nuts are in the oven and we're moving on to the Brussels sprouts. Now, I didn't say to prep any of the Brussels sprouts beforehand. In fact, you don't even have to do anything with the Brussels sprouts. You can just wash them. If they're not washed, make sure you wash them. And you can um, mix them in with the olive oil as they are. But to just kind of let people catch up, I'm gonna take off this little knobby here. I'm just gonna slice it off and I'm gonna leave the Brussels sprouts whole. So I've got a pound here and it shouldn't take me long to just cut off that little knob, but you don't have to cut the little knob off. You can actually, of course, eat it, but you can also eat around it. So depending on how busy you are or how much you wanna do, you can cut the knob off or not. I like this recipe one because it's quick and fast and easy. And, you know, I know that you have a hard time motivating when you get home from work or wherever your day to cook. And I feel sorry for you, but you know who I really feel sorry for? Me. I feel sorry for me because mom, <laughs> many days I cook all day and then I got to come home and cook. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? So you might, uh, if you, maybe you've taken a class before me or for me, maybe you haven't, maybe you'll go to come to like my style because my style is pretty quick and easy. You know, I am looking for the easy route because I do enjoy cooking, 
but you know, for the day to day, I want to get it done, you know, and I do cook all day long and to come home and cook is just kind of painful. So a lot of things that happen fast are the way to go. And, you know, this is a really simple, fast recipe that goes not only well with Gruner, but also just, um, you know, just as easy to make it onto the oven. All right, so that little dingy dongy is the time, means it's time to look at our nuts. So I'm gonna take the stove shot to my Ed McMahon back there. I'm trying to and, find the stove shot. Stove shot, trying to find, she's trying to find the stove shot, everybody. And while she's looking, I'm just gonna mix, my nuts are looking good. But you know, depending on my oven, I might be a little bit leaning toward the back of the front. And that means I have to mix my nuts up with the melted maple syrup, spiced maple syrup to make sure that I'm getting things coated well. Always turn them back. To Laura, a I apologize, but I can't find the stove shot. Can't find the stove shot. Does anyone, stove shot? anyone see a stove in the gallery that oh, I missed? Well, here, I, I'm going to put, uh, uh, let me, uh, let me see. Did we lose the stove shot? How could we lose the stove shot so fast? Let's find out. Well, that's interesting. All right, let's oh, see what's going on. It's there. Is it? Do you see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. I don't want to, I don't want to do that. Okay, well, I don't, I might have lost it myself, but let's try again. I'm going to, for whatever reason, it might have dumped me out. So let's, uh, Whoever's letting people in, you're gonna come back to me. Yep. And let me in, but we'll let that happen. I don't know. I've got a full coverage. I'll see what's gonna. I'll see what's going on. Um, and if we don't get the stove shot back, we'll just play to the other camera. So why aren't you coming? Come on, baby. Hold on. I'm gonna try one more time before we do that. Let's see if it comes in. Not sure. Anyways, we still have two cameras. Oh, there I am. All right. So uh, we'll let we'll let's we'll see what happens with that. Hopefully, we'll get it back. And if not, we'll just play to the overhead camera here. All right. So we've got our Brussels sprouts, and we have trimmed off the bottom possibly, and we're going to just mix them up with about a quarter cup of wine, a quarter cup of wine, quarter cup of olive oil. So I'm going to use them whole. I'm gonna add about a quarter cup. And a quarter cup actually works really well. It's a good amount to be able to keep the, um, the Brussels sprouts moist without necessarily having to put anything on top of them like a piece of aluminum foil. Now, the, I've just got some standard cooking um, extra virgin olive oil here. It's nothing fancy. I don't wanna use fancy olive oil for roasting because a lot of times fancy, more expensive, more flavorful, olive oil has um, is unfiltered and that unfiltering leaves particles that drop the smoke point so what i want to saute with or roast with when it comes to extra virgin olive oil is a filtered olive oil because mm -hmm. it will leave me with a um a smoke point of about 375 to 425. And with a fancier, more expensive, unfiltered, it drops that smoke point. So those types of oils that you get from the farmer's market that are really delicious, save for things you don't cook, like salads. And absolutely, you can saute or roast with an extra virgin olive oil, uh, but you want one that's filtered. All right, we're going to try once again to, it wouldn't let me in. Safari would not let me open uh, the, um, the Zoom. I don't know why. Anyway, so we're, we seem to be going fine. So we'll keep doing with that. All right, so two that we've got our, we've got our Brussels sprouts into our bowl. We put a quarter cup of olive oil in it. And now we're just going to add some salt and pepper to taste. Um, you know, you decide how much salt, how much pepper you want to add. I have two kinds of peppers that I always cook with. Um, uh, with the overhead shot, I've got some black pepper and some white pepper. We'll be using white pepper next week in the sauces. White pepper is a little bit more fruity, a less piquant than black pepper. And white pepper is something that most people don't have a grinder for and don't use in their kitchen. But if you like pepper, you should really think about getting a white pepper grinder 
And if you don't like pepper, you should even think more about getting a white pepper grinder because you might find you finally like pepper. <laughs> Mix your salt and pepper together. And we're just going to put that off to the side because I happen to have a small oven and only one thing can go on at a time. So uh, <laughs> we'll put our Brussels sprouts off to the side now as we wait. Uh, later in the day, uh, later in the uh, class, once our Brussels sprouts cook, a little bit, we're going to add a pear. And the pear, Brussels, Gruner, marriage, uh, menage a trois is just fantastic. Um, you can use any kind of pear you want. I have a Bartlett pear here. Uh, you can peel it. Let me get, if peel you the want. Pear. And you can peel the pear. I know you don't have okay. to, but I'm gonna just use a peeler. I'll take the overhead shot. Dang. I'm gonna peel that pear. I just made poach pears for the first time. I did a French dinner for actually Nancy Riling, if ever, anyone knows her from Portola Valley. And uh, I'd never made a poach pear before. It was actually a really nice dessert. Uh, you know, fruit desserts are actually even more attractive to me as I age. Before it was just straight sugar. Now I'm getting older and uh, know that I'm a sugar addict and have made good progress in getting over it. Fruit desserts come into play. So next week, we're going to be doing a roasted pineapple to go well with that B block Chardonnay. Oh. And um, uh, so this will be a nice addition to our Brussels sprout. Pear. Now, pear, you know, you can cut it or not. And I'm just going to cut the pear basically straight down to avoid the core. You know, if I miss anything up top, I can kind of take that off. But then take those pear pieces and, you know, you basically, when we're cooking and adding ingredients, we think about matching sizes of ingredients. So a pear um, the size of a Brussels sprout may be a little bit big, but, you know, a half, the si half the size of a Brussels sprout is probably a good um bite ratio between Brussels and pear. So certainly you can cut them any size you want, but you know, somewhere around a half a size, half, half of a Brussels sprout is probably a good thing and cut around the core. And then what I'm gonna do, because we're going to let the, this pear sit out for the first 15 minutes of our cooking of our Brussels. Um, we're gonna sprinkle on a little bit of citrus to it. So if you have some lemon or lime, now did we, we don't have any lemon in the, well, you know, if you don't have any lemon or lime and you need a little citrus, you can take some of the orange from some of, you know, from one of the dishes. And all I'm gonna do, and I actually have a lemon. And of course, if you haven't started cutting the pear, you can hold this step and you don't need it, but just in case you, uh, you have already cut your pear, I'll just cut up a little, mm -hmm. take a little lemon juice. Another way to keep, why, do, why am I doing this? I keep it from, um, from oxidizing. So the acid will keep it from oxidizing, right? So a little bit of, which means it won't turn brown. So keeping the oxygen off of it is a good thing. I'll put a little lemon in that. You can put a little lot, uh, orange in that if you have any extra. And then also another technique to just keep the oxygen off is obviously just take some kind of a bag or actually instead of using plastic bag, let's take some beeswax because we're trying to get rid of plastic bags and we want an option to do that. And so we might think about uh, using beeswax, which is a lovely, a gift and it's a, a made from beeswax and it you can use it for about a year and um, it takes the place of plastic wrap. So mm -hmm. we'll just put that there and put it off to the side. Feels nice. Byron Feels and Julie, nice. do you have a question? I see a hand again. Yeah, I just yeah. am wondering how ripe the, the pear should be. Well, you know, I say in the recipe to not have it, you don't want to have it so ripe. Ooh, my nuts are looking good. My nuts are actually good. I'm going to take them off. I am, I've got about a minute left on the timer, but um, make sure you check your nuts before I answer that question. I just want to say, make sure you check your nuts because mine are looking good. How do you know and, when your nuts um, are looking good? 
Well, I'm going to give them over here to this camera oh. because our other camera is gone. But, you know, they look dark. They're, the color is darker and the, um, the viscousness of the maple syrup is thick. So it's not watery anymore. And then I'll just mix that in with, I'll try to pick up some of that extra maple syrup that's in there and pick it up. And then we're gonna just let these guys <coughs> cool down. Oh, Siri, I'm not talking to you. All right. All right, so nuts are out and Brussels sprouts are now going to go in. I've got another baking sheet, just, just a plain baking sheet. And um, I'll put my Brussels sprouts that have my um, olive oil, salt and pepper on. Now I want to say again that people's stoves and ovens are different. And some people have hot spots and all kinds of stuff. So I can actually, at a temperature of, I think it's probably 400 degrees. Let me check to see. Now we're going to change the temperature of our oven to if once we get our nuts out and it's 400 degrees. So I'm going to turn it up a little bit. And I can actually put these Brussels sprouts in as they are without any cover on them. But sometimes, depending on your oven, you might want to cover when you're in the beginning, when you're roasting things, or even later on, if you feel like you still need it because that can help protect them when you get into higher heat. So 400, 425, 450, you're starting to get into higher heat. Um, if you feel comfortable, you know, turn your heat up to 425 on this recipe. Um, there's something about the higher heat when you add a whole Brussels sprout and you have enough oil to cover it, that it allows the Brussels sprout to get moist on the inside, creamy on the inside, but not be burnt on the outside. And that's the problem with Brussels sprouts um, when you don't blanch them before you roast them, right? When you don't, if you don't put them in boiling water or cut them in half and steam them a little bit, you run it. And if you just want to do it the easy route, like I'm doing, I come home, I got to, I got to eat some vegetables for dinner. What is it? It's Brussels. I don't feel like doing much. Basically I take them out of the bag, wash them and put them in the oven is really what it comes down to. But when it's whole, um, you know, and if you have that, that, that ratio, a, a pound of Brussels sprouts, quarter cup of oil it, it, in my oven and in most ovens will say that, you know, you will be able to get that perfect mix of creamy and cooked through, but not burnt, right? But you need to pay attention to your own oven, especially when you start getting to 400 and above. That's where you start maybe bringing out a piece of aluminum foil if you think things are getting too hot and it just kind of depends and we'll, we'll see. So I'm gonna set that timer now for 10 minutes, I think. Oh no, we're gonna put it about 15 minutes. And I'm gonna check the, the uh, temperature to make sure I'm in a good temperature. Okay, let me see. I'm gonna actually change my camera view and see what people are doing. Are you looking at me or are you running around? This has been pretty, pretty easy. What do we got? Oh, we got people looking. We got some people cooking. We got looking, we got cooking. Okay, it's all going on. Is there any questions? <clears throat> Should we take a drink of Gruner Van <laughs> I, I think so. so. Uh, Holly, Holly Myers asked how many acres of Gruner Van Liener are planted. Um, and oh, Tina answered, there are only 155 acres of Gruner Van Liener planted in California. So that was a question answered. Only 155 acres in California? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not a top varietal, but it is growing because it's so good. How many do you guys have planted? One. Oh, <laughs> it, one works. Yeah. One's a, one's right. a good amount of acre. One is the loneliest number. People are busy. I see people are doing stuff. So we're going to, I'm going to ease this into our third recipe or yeah, which is the fennel salad. I think this salad is great with Gruner. When I uh, had Gruner first, I thought of this salad. It's a perfect time for year. And it's also an interesting salad that we're going to make here because it is kind of unique and not necessarily what people are used to. 
So when do you have a salad like this? Well, for instance, I said I just made this French meal uh, for one of our neighbors in Portola Valley, Nancy Ryling, and we had French cassoulet. And I don't know if anyone's ever, ever made a classic French cassoulet. It takes three days to make this. Uh, it, has a, it has four kinds of pig and two kinds of duck and anyways. And we, it was a, it's a very meaty dish. And with that, we added the salad. So it's a unique salad, good for a potluck or just something different, really nice with Gruner. And we're gonna start with a fennel bulb. Let me find my fennel. Here it is. All right, so there's a couple of things with fennel. the fennel. Find the fennel. There's find a couple of things with the fennel. What do we got? We got 15 minutes. So we are gonna go a little longer um, than we, we will at least be going for another half hour. And oh, um, that fennel's uh, so beautiful. We, I have a beautiful fennel. It has some nice fennel fronds and fennel fronds are fine uh, to use as a garnish. So I just wanna take off a few of these little fennel fronds and just keep them off to the side uh, for my garnish. And then I'm gonna cut the fennel top off. I'm gonna cut the bottom, that woody bottom off. And I'm gonna take, remove any of the brown spots that you may have on your fennel if you seem to have it. Sometimes it's good with the fennel, depending on how it looks. And this one's got some brown. Um, you might even take, you know, you might remove the, fir the first hole, um, the first hole layer of it kind of depends what it looks like. So I'm gonna actually cut it in half and I'm just gonna remove that brown part. Okay. Now I'm gonna use something called mandolin and I've got the best mandolin. I've had many, I've had the big French mandolin that I forget how it goes together. And I've had the cheap Asian mandolins that you know break when you use them four times. And I just got this one a couple of years ago at Whole Foods. The name I'd have to look if anybody wants to know, um, I'd have to get my glasses on, but um, I like it because it's small. It fits into my drawer. I don't have to assemble anything and it works. It has four different settings um, and I'm gonna go for, I think the setting three, which is what we used last time we made the salad. And um, I found it at Whole Foods. Uh, a mandolin is a great thing. If you don't have it, you could certainly use just a peeler to cut your uh, fennel thinly. You could use a regular peeler like this and cut some thin fennel. You can use a knife to cut some thin fennel, or we can use a mandolin. So the mandolin just makes it a lot easier. Of course, with the mandolin, you have to watch out for, well, one thing you wanna make sure with any mandolin that your vegetable fits into the mandolin. And here you can see that mine's a little bit long to actually get a solid fit. So I'm just gonna cut off a little bit of the vegetable so that I have a more safe fit. And I think that I have uh, something uh, like a thing to hold on to it, but I've lost it. So I have to be very careful, but I wanna just check to see the thinness and you can adjust accordingly, but you know, fennel is actually, especially raw is best served thin. So we're gonna, either slice up some fennel thinly. We're gonna peel off with a vegetable peeler, some thin fennel, or we're going to use a mandolin. And because of the nature of this cooking class, we're only gonna do maybe half of the bulb. And if you wanna do more later, you're more than welcome, but we don't wanna take a lot of extra time making people wait. So I've got enough here certainly to show it has a Really, really, mine's got a really nice flavor. It makes me think I want a glass. I want a little have a taste of some Gruner Van Leder. <laughs> so. Smell, taste, smell, right? Smell, um, smell, add food, smell, or smell, smell, smell. Yeah. A lot of times you don't even have to put it in your mouth. Anybody have any thoughts on that? A lot of times the smell itself can give you a clue. Anybody want to talk about that pairing wine? Maybe Tina, that's something, you know, sometimes you can't actually taste everything, but you can smell things to see if they go together. 
All right, all right. If anyone wants to talk about that, that's fine, but I'm gonna keep going here and I will take the overhead shot to take this fennel. Now that I've got these thin slices, I'm actually just going to, and this is kind of like a rough cut, but it's fast. I'm gonna slice those thin, those thin slices into some julienne or sticks. And it's very easy by simply stacking the uh, sliced fennel and then just cutting it into sticks. So just do that. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be perfect. And actually the way of the fennel coming in with these kind of wisps and things, I think are actually really nice. So you might not even for some of it have to cut depending on how your fennel is. But if it's a solid piece, you definitely want to turn it into a stick or julienne. And maybe focus on just doing half, half of the bulb so that we can you know, get to the end of class and you can do the extra half of the bulb later. Looks good, feels good. I want to put that in a bowl. Okay, we'll sweep that in our bowl. Now to that, we're gonna add some green olives. Mm. And I like the, um, take the overhead shot. I like the Castrol of Antrano, Castel of, I can't say them, the green olives. Yeah, Ooh, that looks so good. That looks pretty. And of course, with the green olives, you wanna, don't tell people, but you gotta go to the back of the, with uh, back of the shelf. When you get the green olives, or when you want to get these Castro Lovano or however you say it, olives. Um, if you get the ones that are usually in the front of the, if you buy them in the jar, they're usually already turning a little bit. So just reach behind, get the newer ones. And these ones that I have happen to have still a pit in them. So I'm just going to take my knife, as you see, and I'm just going to cut around that pit. So I'm just kind of pitting the olive. You can certainly Put, you can get them without pits. Maybe you've got some without pits. Um, if you've got them with pits. And for half of a bulb of fennel, I took out six olives and I'm just gonna slice those olives into my fennel. Now cooking is about taste and cooking is about smell, but it's also about sound. And I don't think you could probably hear my Brussels sprouts sizzling away in the oven. And that's of course, because the oven is high, but I can hear them. I've got five more minutes left, but there's a lot of stuff going on in that oven. So I think once I finish slicing these olives, that I'm gonna give myself a little look-see because cooking is about sound and you wanna be very aware of what's happening around you sound wise. You know, you can, you can determine when to stir something. Um, most people just stir, stir, stir all the time with cooking, but that's not what you wanna do, especially if you're sauteing. But when that starts getting quiet, that's your, that's your signal to stir. So sound in, in the kitchen isn't, we don't think about it being important, but it's actually really important. And let's, uh, let me just check my Brussels sprouts. I'm like, give them a little shake. I am, I'm just gonna, I'll take the overhead shot if I can. I just usually take them out and just shake them like this, you know? Yeah, there you go. And that gives them another, they look good. They're looking like they're gonna be fine. The temperature is good. It's not too hot. All right. So we got the fennel, we got the green olive. We're gonna take some Satsuma orange. Now satsuma is gonna be ending pretty soon. Uh, we've been having satsumas and bikinis. They get them before, they get them starting around Thanksgiving. Satsumas are fantastic uh, because they are so easy to peel and they're also so pretty and they separate from the peel lovely. So that's why they really are a nice addition for the salad. Um, now, once the peel comes off and I'll take the overhead shot, maybe you wanna give me, there's a lot of, there's still a lot of pith involved in these oranges and you can very easily just peel it off as you can see me doing with the overhead shot. And that's not definitely necessary. I mean, the fiber is nice to have and certainly you want to 
be eating uh, fiber with your juice, right? A glass of orange juice is not as good as a full orange because why? No fiber. No fiber. You need your fiber. No fiber. So um, yeah, pull in a little bit. But you know what? If we're looking for pretty, it's easy to make these oranges look even prettier. And once I clean them up a little bit, I can, depending on the size of them, I can cut them in half. If they're small, I may um, just leave them whole. If they're big, I may cut them in half. So these are a little on the big side. So I am gonna cut these in half into my, into my dish. Okay, I'm just gonna mix that up. There's one more ingredient to add in here besides the salt and pepper, but we're gonna wait on the apple just so that we can get our dressing in so that we can dress um, our apple before it mm -hmm. oxidizes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think then uh, depending on where you are, I would walk over and look at you all, but I think I'm just gonna take a, a glass, a little sip of Gruner Veliner and get myself a um, bowl that will make our, our quick and easy dressing. Mm, smelling good Ooh. in my house. How's Holly, it smelling in your house? Holly's showing her salad, looking good, mom. Oh my, oh, that looks really nice. So yes, we can all be Austri yeah. Austrian and French, maybe. I don't know, well, that for fennel isn't French, but, um, or is it? I don't know. We don't use yeah. fennel very much in this country, Where's do fennel we? fennel from? Fennel. All right, so our uh, dressing is a simple dressing. Uh, we're gonna take another Satsuma Mandarin orange. I'm gonna cut it in half, not take any skin off. And I'm just gonna juice it in its skin, just like any other kind of orange, right? So in one of these nice hand juicers, I'm gonna get about probably a tablespoon or two juice usually about a tablespoon for half. Again, it depends on the size of your satsuma, but you might as well juice the whole thing. Uh, these hand juices are fantastic. Um, they're easy to clean, they're easy to use. They're a nice gift, a lot of people do not have them. And cooking is all about tips. The more you know, the faster, more creative, more delicious your food and cooking will be. So investing in tools that make your life easier that you will use as compared to tools that just fill up your cupboards. Uh, so specific tools, not too many uh, that you will actually use is what we're going for. So about, I would say two tablespoons of Satsuma juice is probably what you have in your bowl. So Laura, that, I'm gonna add a, go fennel ahead. is from the Mediterranean. Mediterranean, yeah, so yeah. somewhere. I've got, I've got some honey here, about a half teaspoon of honey. Uh, next week, we're going to use honey too. We've got a lot of uh, local honeys. Oh, that's my Brussels sprouts. And that might be your Brussels sprouts too. So I'm going to take my Satsuma and honey, just stop for a second uh, and check my Brussels. Reactions, reactions. Reactions. Woo. I'll take the overhead shot. I've got some cute looking Brussels here. And to that, I'm just going to throw in my um, pears. Mm -hmm. oh. Now I want to mix those pears up. I've got the overhead shot for anybody who wants to see. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry about the stove shot. I'm not sure why that's not connecting. It was connecting and then it wasn't. You want to make sure that you're going to mix these in with the oil so that they do roast the oil. Mm -hmm is a protectory blanket to keep moisture in. So mm. if you do not add, you know, get them into some <clears> oil, <throat> um, there's a chance they're gonna dry out too much. Another option is you could just um, put them on one side of your pan and use that piece of aluminum foil to protect them. But I find just adding them in and, um, and then we'll put them into our, back into the oven. Byron, and my I'm friend, gonna... do you have a question? Yeah, just a quick one. Does Neely uh, Vineyards raise bees and honey? We don't have bees right now. The orchard that we're neighbors with has uh, plenty of bees for everyone, but we'll probably get them. Okay, thank you. Ooh, interesting. All right, so um, 
yeah, so back to the honey, we, we made, we added some of the local honey uh, into our Satsuma juice. This is again, well, Laura, there's a, there a question, how much honey in the dressing? Well, if you're going to get about um, a ta two tablespoons of Satsuma, I have a half a teaspoon on the recipe. Um, again, you know, you might want a little less, you might want a little more, but I, you know, as far as about two tablespoons of orange juice, uh, and then the, the way that we, um, two tablespoons, half a teaspoon is a good, um, is a good mix. Thanks. All right. So now I'm going to add some mustard and mustard and dressing adds, a, does a really special, has a really special, it has a special job. Uh, I've got some whole grain mustard here. Uh, you can use any kind of mustard you possibly you might have, except for yellow mustard, which isn't really good for anything besides hot dogs. And I don't even know if it's good for that. Um, what's the role of mustard in a salad dressing? Who knows? It serves as an emulsifier. So oil and vinegar don't mix, right? We know that. And what, what, what mustard does is it coats the molecules of fat to allow the acid to stick to it. It's an emulsifier, it brings things together. So not only does it add flavor, but it adds emulsification. And we're gonna add about a, a quarter teaspoon, maybe a little less uh, or a little more to um, your dressing. And again, I've got whole grain mustard, which is a really fun mustard to have uh, in your repertoire, but uh, any kind of Dijon or something will work fine. And then about two tablespoons of a good quality sherry vinegar. Now, sherry vinegar and vinegar in general is kind of like wine, the more, so, well, not always, it's not always true with wine, but, you know, often we pay a little bit more, we get better quality. So if you pay a little bit more for your vinegar, you're going to get something that's got a little bit less of a, of a kick to it and a little bit more flavor. And so the investment in a better quality vinegar is an investment worth making. And I add a little bit of dash of red pepper flake. And if you don't like spice, you don't have to, but a little bit of red pepper flake into our dressing is fantastic. And we're gonna give this a mix. Okay, so we've got about, well, I'd say 10 minutes left in our class, maybe a little bit longer. Um, we'll see, but we've got a nice mm. dressing here. Smells good. Oh, smells great. And we're going to add our dry. First off, we want to taste our dressing. Do we add any salt? No, we didn't add our, we didn't add our, we didn't add our olive oil. So let's add a little bit of olive oil. What did I say about a quarter cup, a uh, quarter cup. This is where you use your olive oil that does not, um, that may be not filtered. And I'm going to add it slowly to my vinegar and orange juice. Why slowly? I want to give it a chance to emulsify, to mix, to incorporate. Thomas Keller is that he was a teacher of mine from the French Laundry. He would the way that he always I never forget. He said, "You whisk in a um, figure eight. So figure eight is how he taught us to whisk. Is that how you whisk? Um, that's how I was now, but sometimes it's hard. You try to do figure eight. Uh, there's going to be a couple of people that are like, figure eight, what? Ooh, what? <laughs> and you know what I don't have in the recipe is salt. Hmm. But mine has a nice balance. Could use a little bit more mustard. We want to taste things. Um, the mustard is going to give me a little bit of depth. So I'm actually going to add a little bit more. And then I'm going to add some salt and pepper. And what I am going to add from my lovely little salt shaker here that I got from Morocco that fits well into our last class, it's some flake salt. Flake salt is salt that has more character. It's salt that has more body. Uh, Maldon is a good, is a, is a well-known brand of it. And flake salt will not only give you saltiness, but will give you crunch which is really attractive. And then I'm going to add some of my white pepper in my white pepper grinder that I get from Crate and Barrel, 995. I think they're still 995. I think I just saw. <laughs> white pepper corns are hard to find. I'm, I'm really finding them online these days. Um, and we'll add that salt and pepper and mix it in. And again, it's always good to have some spoons next to you. Tasting spoons is what they call it so that you can taste your wares. 
Mm -hmm. A little more salt. Maybe I'm going to add a little bit of the kosher salt. Kosher salt is actually less salty than Morton salt. Morton salt. Do you know why? Why? Because kosher, kosher salt grains are bigger. It's, it has bigger grains, which means you get less salt per teaspoon or half teaspoon. Mm. It also doesn't use anti-caking agents to keep, allow the salt to, mix, to go through your salt shaker. They add something called a caking agent. What? And that leads it. I know it's crazy. And that leads your salt to be bitter. So if you ever did a salt taste test between Morton's and um, uh, just that, you know, kosher salt in a jar or in a big box, the red box, you would never eat Morton salt again. Now I have enough dressing to add my um, apple and I'm just going to do a quick uh, cut of my granny spith or other kind of apple into my salad. I'm personally going to leave my skin on. The Granny Smith is a nice choice for this because it, it is so tart, but certainly it's something that we can either add in or take out. But I, I don't usually eat a Granny Smith apple. I, I, Granny Smith apples, I usually will, will either bake with or um, add to things. And if I want to eat, you know, an apple, I'll take a different brand and we'll mix that all up. Now with the acid of the dressing, it will protect the apple. My apple pieces are a little bit big, but we want to kind of move along because we've got one more recipe and we want to finish our, oh, we have our appetizer. Yeah. So we want to finish that up. It's a quick, it's, it's a quick thing. And mm, with the cell, with good. this, yeah, with this salad, you want to give it a chance to marinate. So the idea, and it's a perfect salad for any kind of dinner party because you can make it before, dress it before, leave it in the refrigerator, and then when it's time to serve, it's all ready to go. Like, so how long would you want to leave it to marinate? Well, I think about an hour. You know, we'll, we're just going to leave it in uh, the, the, the refrigerator right now. You can leave it out because we're, we're going to be ending class soon. But to, you know, give it a chance. I mean, if it didn't marinate, it wouldn't be like the end of the world. But um, it is nice to give it a chance to marinate um, because, um, because of the nature of the ingredients will, um, will set themselves well for that. Okay, so I'm gonna get my end dive out. Then I'm gonna look at the camera and see where everybody is. And we gotta find that end dive. End dive. And uh, okay, so we've got a few more minutes and I think we, I'm gonna just make the appetizer. I mean, we can keep going after we finish that. Let me see, everyone's looking at me. All right. So- um, Anybody find their end dive? I got my end dive. Nice. Yeah, we're gonna make our appetizer. And then if we decide we want to make a quick salad, we can do that too. But this is a fun appetizer. Again, when, when we sat around, it was Tina and uh, the assistant wine maker, who I'm sorry, the name escapes me. What's Virginia Rosco? Virginia and I, when we were talking about, you know, how blue cheese would be good with Grunewaldliner, which means take anytime I say Grunewaldliner, you have to take a glass a drink. <laughs> so here we go. Cheers. Uh, cheers to 2023. Um, so this is a perfect appetizer, good for the holidays, but even still, I find endive is the forgotten um, vegetable. And, you know, endive has, not only does it have just a nice vegetable-y or lotus-y kind of, you know, flavor and something a little different and a different, um, uh, uh, you know, it gives us a different presentation than say a butter lettuce or romaine, but what it has is that unique shape. And that unique shape is great in a salad as well as as a um, as an appetizer cup. So interesting. This mm. this guy's. Let me see. This guy's not coming out. So let's see, because that one wants to come out first. So yeah, the, the unique shape of endive is fascinating. And in order to be able to do to to take advantage of the shape, um, we have to continue to cut the bottom off so that we can pull off the individual leaves. So once you can no longer just naturally pull off those leaves, then you cut off another part of the bottom 
and you take out another part of the leaf. Now in making this appetizer, if you make a lot of them, you can make them beforehand. I just made this appetizer for a holiday party I did. Um, but the important thing is, is if you really are going to either, you know, want to make it beforehand, want to sit on a plate for a couple of, for an hour or so, or even just make your plate look nice, you'll notice that these round leaves kind of fall over. So what we wanna do is take our knife and cut ourselves just a little base out of the bottom. You don't wanna cut through it, because then your ingredients may fall. But if you can cut that little base kind of at the place where you see that the, you know, that the convexness, is that it? would be the strongest, that's where it sits. Then with that base, it no longer rolls around like this one, but stays Brilliant. firm. Isn't that? Brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let's see, we wanna put, maybe we'll put that on here. So I've got a couple things that we're gonna put onto our very um, simple appetizer. And we've got some blue cheese. We have our candied nut. And we have a selection of different kinds of fruit. The recipe has spring fruit, winter fruit, you know, fall fruit. And so what I'm gonna use for this one, what I was using in the fall was uh, persimmon and pomegranate. Now those are harder to find. So I'm finding kiwi. And I just happen to have two kinds of kiwi here that I got from Bianchini's. Um, one is the regular kiwi that's green. And then the other one, let's just see when I cut it open. Well, it's, uh, it's gold. So it's, it's a gold kiwi, but I don't know if it was worth 250. I actually think, <laughs> you know, I thought it was going to be really gold, but it actually kind of looks like a sickly green. So <laughs> I thought it was going to be yellow. And then I was going to do a juxtaposition of the two. But this little kiwi cost 250. It was two for five bucks at Bianchini. Wow. So I think the regular, the regular what is fine. Now, the interesting thing about kiwi that a lot of people don't know is you don't have to peel it. If you cut it really thin, you can absolutely serve it and eat it with the skin on. There's no reason to hmm. take the skin off. Hmm. So we're going to just cut a little bit of kiwi into creative shapes. We're going to take some blue cheese. And I'm using the Point Reyes Blue Cheese. Point Reyes Blue Cheese is our um, up in Point Reyes. It's a family farm uh, that has gotten very successful in making blue cheese, so much so they're in Costco now. But the Giacomini's uh, family has been involved in you know, farming for many years. And they found out they have cows. I'm going to put a little bit of this blue cheese on the um, end of the end of the um, endive. Um, they found out that just raising cows and having milk wasn't enough to be able to keep a farm alive. And so they um, decided to go into product and Point Raised Blue Cheese has been a very popular product. We're lucky to have the Giacomini family as well as many of the, um, the dairy farms up in Marin. Um, uh, we live in a cheese region, which is sometimes hard to remember because um, how many, we often maybe we don't go up to Marin, uh, but there are many. There's probably eight or nine or ten cheese makers now in Marin, maybe more. And um, coming up in March, there is the annual cheese um, festival. It happens up in Sonoma. It's a great event. Um, if you like cheese and you want to learn more about it, I encourage you to think about um, going to the festival this year. Let's go. That sounds so good. Yeah, absolutely. And so we added a little blue cheese and now we're gonna just stack in a few uh, kiwis, which are seasonal. I, I do have some pomegranate, um, but I think I'll just keep with the kiwi. Let's see, now this one is falling over. And if it's falling over, I probably didn't put the, the um, little base in the right place. So you just wanna make sure that the base is in the right place. A little bit of seasonal fruit, you can change that up. And then we're gonna take some of our candied nuts, which have now hardened, which is good. Let's taste our nuts. Mm. Wow, those are good. Now this is a bite size, so you don't want to, you know, have so much that people can't actually put it into their mouth at once. 
So a few nuts. And then for a um, garnish, I actually, and I get these at Bianchini's too, the salad mix, which is fantastic. Easy way to get more greens into your diet. I have these out and I'll um, maybe garnish it with a few of these. Those are sprouts? Sprouts, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now for folks that aren't here, I know that we're online. So a lot of people may, I keep on saying Bianchini's and that's because Bianchini's is our grocery store here and one of our grocery stores in Portola Valley, family owned, Kevin Bianchini. Um, but of course you can get it wherever. So these sprouts are really fun and they add a nice, kind of mix to it. Now, the, um, we're coming to the end of the class, so I'm not gonna make the dressing, but they're really gorgeous. They're pretty, they're fun. They're a great thing to do um, when you have a party because people come over and they say, what can I do? And you give them these individual little ingredients and they um, feel like they've really participated and people enjoy doing this kind of stuff. All right, so we're gonna dish up what we got. I'm gonna check my Brussels. And I think my Brussels are looking good. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, I've got a few more minutes. I'm gonna take the overhead shot. We've got mm -hmm. nice color on our Brussels. And the way, of course, we can really tell if they're ready to go is you take a fork into them. The pears are good. Oh, soft and creamy, that's what we want. So these, well, that guy might not be ready, but this guy is. So for the most part, our Brussels sprouts feel done. They could use maybe a second or so. So I'm just gonna leave them in there while we set up everything else. I'm gonna look at my camera to see where everybody is and uh, see if people are looking at me. Oh, somebody's having some Gruner Van Liener. Oh. I think it's time for us to have some Gruner Van Liener too. Oh, look Byron's at that. Byron's got some endives there. Nice. Looking good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna get, we're gonna get set up here. So what are we gonna assemble? We're gonna assemble our salad, which is really assembled and ready to go. We're gonna put out our Brussels sprouts. We're gonna garnish a little bit and kind of show off what we have. So let's wow. do that. <clears throat> so first I'm gonna, again, my, our nuts sitting here on the back burner, come off really easily with a sill pad, but you gotta break them up. They become crispy. And so at this point, you could just put them in a jar, put a little label on it with your name and, and give it to your neighbor for, for your late Christmas gift. These, they last in the jar a nice time, make it airtight, you know, definitely be good for a couple weeks. And uh, they're just fun and easy. And the flavor is real nice. And let's see how that spice holds up with the Gruner. I'm curious. Mm -hmm. So I tried to tone the spice down so that it's not like spy out there, you know. So it's interesting. I like it. I, I wouldn't say I would have a bowl of nuts with the Gruner, but mm -hmm. I like it. Okay. Uh, we want a salad. We've got our fennel salad. Oh, with, with um, Satsuma and with apple. And then of course, for time of service, we'll add some avocado. Now, the nice thing about the salad, actually, let me taste the salad first. You always wanna taste your stuff uh, because really the only way you're gonna know how it goes together. Hmm, a little salt and a little gruner, let's taste it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those two go real nice together. And with the avocado that we're going to add in, we can add it right into the dressing. And of course that will keep it from turning. So here I'm just for purposes, we're just cutting it here, taking it out and we can dice this guy right into the bowl as you see over here. And then we'll save a little bit for the side for the garnish. And of course that will keep it from oxidizing, which is important. We don't want brown olives or we don't want brown pears. We don't want brown apples. 
And then when you have ex the extra salad dressing, you can um, obviously use it for something else. So, and this salad is a nice salad to top it with a little bit of, again, our avocado or our fennel fronds, which is just fun to say, fennel fronds. If I can find it, here they are. Our fennel fronds, really cute. You could always add, a, if you need one little green, a little frisee in the salad is a nice addition um, to give it a little bit. And even some arugula is a nice addition. And arugula goes, um, we don't have arugula today, but people will say arugula is kind of one of those hard things to pair. Gruner fits in well with that. And then let's get our um, Brussels sprouts out. Well, our class went longer than I expected. I thought this was kind of, it so tells you what you think. You never quite know. So here's our own Brussels again. Oh, overhead shot maybe. Mm -hmm. Looking good, nice color, a little bit. You've got a little bit of black, a little bit of brown. You don't want all black, but you still get some green, you know? So this type of style with this, you know, one, one, um, one pound of Brussels to a quarter cup of olive oil really works well. And our pears are looking perfect. You know, they can have a little caramelization on them, um, but not, uh, they're not brown. Hold on, I gotta put this down. I can get burning up a little bit, um, but a nice mix. And then for the, uh, the um, if we chose to make the endive salad, basically we take the same ingredients. We, chop, we, we could chop the endive up, we may leave it whole and then just toss the endive in with the dressing and then sprinkle the nuts and the uh, fruit on top. And so you have um, either way, you can have a, um, you know, you can serve it as a salad or you can serve it as the appetizer that we did make today. So, and again, as a reminder, these are our blue cheese and candied nut, um, kiwi, with a little bit of garnish of um, the pea sprouts. And so that, my darlings, is our meal for today. Maybe I can, well, you know what? I'll I'm take do? it. Gonna, Looks like a great dinner. I'm just gonna put this here. And yeah, so if you if you looked at that, we, we gave a suggestion to, you know, make a little fish or maybe a roast chicken, grill up some chicken. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's have a bite. Let's have a drink. Let's answer some questions. Let's talk about what we're going to do next week. Should we go right into that or take a little break? Maybe I'm going to see what it, oh, I'm going to see what everybody's doing. So because I, I can't Byron's see got a, Byron and Julie have a salad there. Oh, my God. That looks good. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, I see people eating. I see Anybody some people else want to share something. Hold on. Oh, I got the nuts. A... OK. Laura, got, these nuts ooh. are delicious. And this was so fun to watch you cook. Oh, and I, I was watching you too, except I wasn't watching you that close as you weren't watching me that close. But um, excellent. Yeah, anybody, anybody Any else other wanna dishes want to share? I sh we shared ours. That This is all of ours. And we everything's on there. It's still absolutely fun and delicious. And interesting yeah, yeah. to pair, and um, I'm going to wait on that um, because we may lose a few people. I just want to say a few things about next week. Next week is our vegan for the masses. Tina gave her the vegan for the masses. I think that's fun. Well, it'll be primarily vegan, but you know, again, we don't follow, we don't real, we're not rule followers here. We kind of do what works for us. So we're going to be making a cashew and leek sauce, a creamy cashew and leek sauce. And for that, um, we're going to send you the recipes tomorrow. Um, I want to say a couple things about some of the ingredients. Uh, anytime you want to buy nuts, if you're in the California area and probably in other areas as well, maybe some of you are in Idaho, I can't speak to that. But the best play to buy, place to buy nuts is still Trader Joe's. You get the good, best price. They have high quality. And we're looking for raw cashews that are whole um, because um, pieces of cashews sometimes will be dry and they won't incorporate well into a sauce. And we definitely don't want them toasted. 
So raw cashews, Trader Joe's is a good place to get those. Um, you're going to soak them overnight. And if you forget to soak them overnight, uh, and the recipe will tell you that, then um, don't worry, you'll still be able to do the class. Um, and also it talks about having firm tofu. Uh, we will be doing a tofu dish. I'll take the overhead shot. Here's mm -hmm. a company that used to be based in Fairfax, um, California. I think they moved since then, it's called Wildwood. And you'll notice this is super firm, high protein tofu. So that's what we're looking for. The firm tofu will be good or the super firm, extra firm will be good for the dish we're making, which will be something that we're going to saute and um, eat like meat. So we want it chewy. So you don't use soft tofu, you use firm tofu for that. We're also going to use an ingredient you may not be used to, and it's called nutritional yeast. It is, um, it is grown, actually, it's not the yeast, though. it's not brewer's yeast that's grown on the top of the beer. It's actually cultivated from B vitamins. It's what we used to put on our popcorn in the 60s when people weren't eating butter. And it has a very unique flavor. You can buy it at pretty much any store. I mean, certainly at Whole Foods kind of stores, but I think even Safeway. So it might be a little tricky to find, but it's a unique ingredient and it will be very important for the sauce next week. So a little bit of uh, nutritional yeast. And then we also um, encourage you to try out a new product that I know you'll use again, including the nutritionist, which is called Bragg's Liquid Aminos. It's like a soy sauce, but it's not fermented and it's lighter than soy sauce. We're going to use it to drizzle on our tofu next week and our Meyer lemon, which will go very well um, with um, our B block Chardonnay. And if you don't get, if you don't find Bragg's Liquid Aminos, you can always use soy sauce again. So, or tamari. And we can talk about the difference of why they call them so many things next week. And other than that, there's one other last thing I want to show you. And that is um, our sesame honey cashews from Trader Joe's. Unfortunately, I can't show them to you because I ate them all last night. <laughs> um, I, have a I have a trick. I leave these in the freezer and it's going to be fantastic. We're going to put them on our caramelized uh, pineapple. That's going to go really well with our B block Chardonnay. And I think I might turn you on to just a new stack by putting these sesame honey cashews from Trader Joe's into your freezer. You may never forgive me for that one because this bag what? isn't that old. And <laughs> Laura got down on the munchies when she was doing that. So <laughs> <laughs> that uh, next week we're going to do a creamy cashew pasta and some caramelized um, and some caramelized pineapple. Uh, so that's going to be our, our recipe. You'll get the recipes tomorrow. And I look forward to tasting and seeing how this works. Do, is there any questions? Can I, can we raise a toast to 2023? And I'm so thank you so much for sticking around class. I didn't think we were going to go this long. Well, we did. <laughs> thank you. That was fun. That was lovely. Yeah. Okay, everybody. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get the um, Laura, definitely a question. You kind of missed where the shallot went. <laughs> what was, that again? Can you repeat that? I think we missed where the shallots went. Shallot. Oh, salad salad dressing. Dressing. Oh, I have shallots actually. In the endive <laughs> dressing. Oh, oh, the shallots go in the endive dressing. Thank oh, you. Yes, I actually have shallots. Okay, okay thank you. Salad. And well, yeah, and you know what? If you want to use the endive as a salad, you've got extra dressing probably at the bottom of the fennel, and you can just toss it in, and that might actually be something that you like too. So, um, you have different options. We make this dressing. Okay, thank you so much. Have a great. This was day. really fun, Laura. Thank you. It was Thanks, really, everyone. Really, really, really fun. Everyone, thank you. Yeah. Happy New, Year. Happy New Year. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. Happy New Year, Happy everyone. Next week. Bye. Thank you. See you next week. Leave. 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 We don't really want to leave. <laughs> well, maybe we'll go.